So we're absolutely delighted to have Ross Glotzbach here with us today. Ross Glotzbach is the CEO and Head of Research of, South, of Southeastern Asset Management and has 18 years of investment experience. He's a co-portfolio manager of the Longleaf Partners, Longleaf Small Cap, and Longleaf Global Funds, as well as the Longleaf Partners Global UCITS Fund. He's also a member of Southeastern's Executive Committee. Prior to joining Southeastern in 2004, he was a corporate finance analyst at Stevens uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas. He graduated from Princeton University with a bachelor's degree in economics. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Glotzbach. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, this is great. Well, I promise this will be short and leave plenty of time for questions. <laughs> so here's, here's our intro slide. Um, next slide is our all important disclosure disclaimer sl slide that everybody can read here. Um, Moving on to the next one, um, this is just kind of a big overall overview for those of us who might want to see all the numbers in one spot. I will talk more about the things that we feel make us unique in the next few slides. Um, so long-term concentrated engaged value investors, what does that mean? Um, <laughs> so on the long-term, uh, first of all, we have been in business since 1975, uh, founded by our current chairman, Mason Hawkins then. Uh, Staley Cates, our current vice chairman, joined us about 10 years later. Um, I joined us uh, about 15 or so years after that. And we have a great team of 65 people all around the world now. Um, so long-term doesn't just mean that we've been around for a long time. It also means that we invest for the long-term. As you can see here, average five plus year investment horizon. We like to call one of our main advantages time horizon arbitrage. The stock market is always trying to figure out next month, next quarter. Uh, but if we can take that three to five years plus view from now, uh, we think we've got a good advantage doing that. And it also brings us more credibility as we you know, invest in these companies that they know we're in for the long haul too. Uh, concentrated. So we are concentrated at our company level. We are 100% employee owned. And we have been putting our own money into our own strategies uh, for decades. So we are our largest or second largest client, depending on how you want to calculate it. Um, so we're all in. <laughs> we think that's the right way to do it. Um, but our portfolios are also very concentrated. We think that mathematically you get uh, a lot of the diversification that you need once you start getting into the teens, uh, depending on how you're structuring these portfolios. Um, so as you can see here, on average, most of our portfolios are in the 18 to 22 range, but some will be more concentrated. We're glad to do that. We want to work with our each individual client where possible. And then some are a little more concentrated for some of our clients who might want, you know, a broader array uh, of what we do just within one portfolio. And we're glad to do that too, up to a point. Um, then engaged, um, long-term and concentrated go a long way when you need to really engage with your companies. Um, we have been filing 13 Ds occasionally since the 1990s. We have been helping companies improve their boards, improve their management teams uh, for, for a very long time. And because we are true partners with them as big owners ourselves and as long-term owners ourselves, uh, that goes a long way uh, when you know they know that we're not just there for a quick buck and move on to the next thing. So finally, uh, value on this slide, I'm gonna head on to the next one here. Um, as we define value, you will hear these three words from us over and over and over again. Business, people, price. It's in that order uh, because business, first we want a great business uh, that we can understand. You know, high quality company with a growing competitive advantage, uh, a good sound balance sheet, focus on higher free cash flow per share in the years to come. Um, we also want great management partners, uh, both uh, executives and people on the board who are owners or who think like owners, and most importantly, who act like owners. Uh, again, they don't care. They're not trying to hit some quarterly revenue target. They are trying to grow the long-term value per share and free cash flow per share of this company. We can talk more about ways that they do that in the future. Now, of course, everybody wants that. Who doesn't want a great business with great people running it? It's got to be somewhat, uh, you know, hidden or misunderstood, that quality. Because if it's staring you in the face quality, um, you know, market 
stock market like you've had over the last few years, it's going to be trading at a pretty high multiple. When you've got a high multiple, you don't have a good margin of safety and you risk losing long-term permanent capital, which is not what we were about. So we were trying to pay two thirds or less of our appraised value for these companies. Um, heading on to the next slide, you know, we uh, do not necessarily have like the separate ESG group within our firm. And then here's the other part of our firm. We all want to be in this together because we think that ESG is something that we have been focused on even before it was <laughs> known by those initials uh, for, for, you know, our 45 plus years. Um, on the G, you know, again, because we're 100% employee owned and we, uh, you know, are thinking for the long term at our own company, um, it's always been an important thing there. And then, as I mentioned, you know, we've been engaging with companies for a very long time. We never outsource proxy voting or do anything like that. The E and the S, you know, we think over the long run for qualitative bottom-up business appraisers, this will be a great thing that the market focuses on more. You know, essentially asking ourselves using judgment, is this company that we are considering investing in a net, you know, benefit to society? And so that's a big, hard question, uh, but it is an important one that we must be able to answer confidently. Um, and then, you know, once we've, we've done that, we, we, we try to get, get the right price, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then it all gets back to just, you know, as, as we said here, working together in the community and things bigger than ourselves. Um, so we need to find great investment ideas for all this to happen. <laughs> and this slide could talk about it for days, but essentially it defines our investment process on one slide if we had to. You know, there's thousands of companies around the world that are potentially big enough for us to invest in. Uh, we have a team of research generalists, uh, 15 of us, uh, offices in Memphis, London, and Singapore. We want to encourage cross-border work there, but we also want people on the ground in all of these offices building out their own networks uh, closest to them, you know, with time zone efficiency and, and all that good stuff. So there's thousands out there. We screen through them various ways. That usually leads to hundreds each year, uh, broadly, <laughs> where we do more work, you know, sorting through that business people price on each one of them. And usually we'll get into, you know, full-blown debate on dozens, you know, where deep vetting through our network, you know, it's, it's pretty valuable that we have, you know, met, met so many people across business for, for years and we can usually say, okay, does that person at that board maybe know this person uh, who's this executive in this same city or something like that and just go down the list. Um, we have a formal devil's advocate process, you know, that kind of takes some of the heat out of it, just makes it, makes it happen every time. And it's not a knee jerk opposite of the case devil's advocate. It's an informed independent opinion. And we try to meet in the middle of the truth. And because we only need, you know, mathematically in a 20 stock portfolio in a five year holding period, a few new stocks each year, we can afford to be very choosy. Um, so final thing here, this is the last slide, I promise, <laughs> is that, um, you know, if I could give a little career advice, advice to, you know, young value investors, um, it's often just to, to keep going <laughs> and keep getting better because it's, it's not always easy and fun. Um, I might be thinking a little bit of the previous 15 years of value investing and less of the, you know, previous 200 years, <laughs> because we still very much believe it works over the extremely long run. Um, and we're, we're closer to that now than we've been. Um, but just kind of a mathematical version of a behavioral finance thing on this slide. Um, losses have been shown in psychological studies to feel about twice as bad as winners feel good. And in our business, if you're right three out of five times, you're doing a great job. Unfortunately, those two times you're wrong, they get you. They, they don't feel great. And you kind of have four bad feeling units versus three good feeling units uh, a lot of the time. But in the long run, as Ben Graham said, you know, the market is a weighing machine, not a voting machine. And the ultimate returns will be weighed and, you know, just keep going out there. So maybe I'll stop, stop the sharing now and we can uh, get on into the Q&A.
Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. That was a really great presentation. And uh, yeah, let's dive into the Q&A. So our first question is, overall, compared to in the past, do you believe that it is getting easier for companies to maintain their moats as a result of global scale or harder for companies to maintain their moats because of the rapid pace of technological change? You know, I think that <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, I think it's going to vary some probably by industry and geography. Um, that's a bit of an initial like cop-out answer. I think um, also there will be factors that will potentially preclude some of this moatiness from digital companies maybe being as, as unfettered as it would be, you know, five, 10 years ago, right? Like what makes so many of these great digital companies have incredibly powerful cross-border moats is that they know what works in one place often works in another thing. And they have more data than anybody else does on this. Now, as people come to potentially own their own data more, and there are more and more restrictions on that, we'll see um, how, how that happens. I mean, I think in the, you know, you think back to some of those old, you know, wonderful Warren Buffett quotes about inevitable companies and, you know, investing in Coke in the, the 1980s and 1990s. And you just knew, you know, when the Berlin Wall fell, there were a lot of people who wanted to drink Coke all over the place. Uh, I, I feel like a lot of that, uh, you know, the world has gotten quite global and will it be this global, you know, in the future? Or could it be more localized potentially? Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I think this is one where I don't see a clear winner on either side of that debate just because of how things have evolved so, so rapidly and how much some of these might have already played out. We would probably bet on big global established company where things translate across regions over small, localized, less established thing. But, you know, we'd also want to know what we're paying for each of those. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And thank you for that commentary. Um, some students have observed from your uh, filings that you've recently sold out or really reduced some of your holdings in the companies that are located in either Hong Kong or China. And we're wondering if you had any commentary on that. You know, actually, we, I wouldn't say that we've, you know, dramatically reduced our, our China holdings or anything like that. So I'll walk through kind of how, how we think about um, investing in our specific China companies right now. Um, and, you know, I think we, we have a good, healthy debate on this. And I think it's great that we have, you know, local talent on the ground. And I can talk to, to Gowan, who's from mainland China, about a lot of these issues. And we're not just people of Memphis trying to guess at it. But it is, it is hard to predict, you know, exactly a lot of ways that, that things will go in China. So what we have focused in on over the last year and why you might have seen some, some moves in the portfolio, we want Chinese or China related investments where we can win in idiosyncratic ways that aren't necessarily a 100% macro bet on China. This might be a company like CK Hutchison where it's technically headquartered in Hong Kong, but you know, this is a really, when you think about it, a blue chip collection of assets around the world where they've got European telecom, they've got pipelines and ports, they've got Watson um, drug stores, uh, and, you know, doing smart things like selling their cell towers business at 30 times EBITDA and buying back their own stock when they trade it five or six times. We think we can win in that in a variety of environments, but because it has that Hong Kong listing, a lot of people just don't even go, go anywhere near that, you know. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's a few others I could talk through, but last year, while it might look like we have less China waiting today than we did then, that's because we think some things changed uh, in China last year, and we wanted to reassess and focus in on those investments that we feel the best about, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And when you say some things changed in China, you're talking about the stricter regulation now? Yes. I mean, you know, the uh, what happened with the uh, for-profit education industry over there, for example. Um, what, uh, you know, it does seem like, like I just mentioned in the, in the previous question, you know, there's uh, tighter regulations on digital businesses over there uh, as well. Um, they're going through some, some real estate issues in China that, you know, seem like they've been building 
and about to break for the last 10 years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a hard, that's a hard thing to predict, but there probably is some, some real estate excess, but has that already been priced into a lot of things? You know, it's a very stock by stock specific uh, discussion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And let's transition to talking more about how do you see the future of, uh, or how, do, how attractive do you think the oil and natural gas and just the energy in the, uh, sector is to invest in today, specifically through the context of CNX resources? Yeah, so we, um, we think that, you know, our ability hopefully to, to look at these different companies on a bottom-up basis on business people price can bring us to a company like CNX, uh, like Williams. Um, you know, as I mentioned, ESG is is very important. We think there could be some differences between oil and natural gas long term. Um, we would feel better about the demand outlook for natural gas, um, but you know that's also somewhat of a of a macro call. Um, we would also feel better about you know kind of marginal marginal cost versus price type analysis for those two uh, relative commodities. What we like about CNX on business people price on the business, um, they are a low cost player. You know, if you're going to be in a commodity business, your mode has got to be low cost player because they own their own pipeline infrastructure, often own the land uh, on which they are drilling because they're a 150 year old company. Uh, that's going to be low cost. We also like how they hedge their production, which some might not like that. Some might say, I want exposure to a commodity. We want an exposure to free cash flow per share <laughs> and uh, the lower risk we can get that that's great and so when you hedge and lock that in that's good and that gets to the people we think we've got a very strong team here uh will thorndike who who wrote uh the outsiders one of our favorite books is the chairman uh they get it through and through on sherry purchase um they're also generating actual free cash flow per share when many of their competitors are uh hoping for theoretical free cash flow per share. Um, so that's a big difference. Uh, so we think we've got, you know, low cost, long lived player here. Uh, that's really almost more of a, of a factory uh, than, than a, you know, some kind of wildcat uh, driller or something like that. So um, that's, that's rare to have. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that commentary. And switching over to, to talking about XOR, is that like a, some of the parts thesis that you're having on that? It's, you know, on that one, business people price, I might start on the people side of things, uh, where John Elkan has just done an incredible job. He is the, you know, leading owner of the, the controlling family uh, at, at, at XOR, the Agnelli family. You know, back when we invested in this one almost 10 years ago, uh, I think a good quip about it would be that it was thought of as an inferior way to own one of the worst car companies in the world. <laughs> you know, it was this convoluted Italian structure. Fiat was going through some challenges. Uh, but thanks to John, you know, and, and a good team around him, including, you know, great Sergio Marchionne, um, they essentially took Fiat, added Chrysler, took out Ferrari, made it into a global luxury brand and it trades to big high multiple today. They also took out CNH tractors. They just split that company into two parts. Uh, then along the way, they bought a reinsurance company. <laughs> They're in the process of probably selling that for a, a good bit more than they paid. Uh, and then by the way, they merged Fiat Chrysler into Peugeot to finally get that kind of global scale uh, that we think makes a lot of sense. And they picked up another great manager when they got Carlos Tavares there. So we think a great collection of assets like that should trade at a premium when it's grown its value per share at a very strong double digit rate ever since we've been invested. Um, and yet it's still at a discount, you know, you know? Um, we think uh, once this partner re deal um, gets across the line, which it seems, seems likely to happen, even though it didn't, didn't happen once before, then they'll have just kind of unassailable uh, financial firepower to do many more interesting things. You know, they, they also, you know, are interested in looking around at the luxury industry. They own part of The Economist, part of the Juventus soccer team. There's a lot going on there. Uh, and it's not the kind of company that any one single industry sell side analyst can say, this company is at a 12 times PE and it should be at a 13 times PE. <laughs> That's just not this company, but we've, we've gotten to know it 
uh, for a long time. Thanks to our Europe team. Thanks to Josh Shores for, for finding it. So um, we think it's got a lot more room to go. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, can you speak a little bit about your thoughts of investing in Japan? I mean, obviously, that's a very different uh, place in terms of corporate culture and uh, management and some other capital allocation policies. So talk to that about that a little bit, please. Yep. We have found through some, some painful lessons, but also some victories um, in Japan, that uh, the people side of things is extremely, extremely important on business people price. And if you go into something not excited about your partners day one, it might not matter how cheap it is. But that's also not why you should just give up on the whole country, because there are a lot of very good, high quality companies there. There are owners that you can partner with, uh, many that we've partnered with. You just got to be extra, extra, you know, focused on that people side of the equation going in, you know, and, and they need to be actively the kind of partners who are going to do things like buyback shares when they're discounted, uh, make creative moves to grow long-term free cash flow per share. So uh, that's a lesson we've learned. Yeah, absolutely. And let me ask you, so Japan, it's a pretty interesting market because you have on the one side, you have these mega, mega, mega conglomerates, just these huge companies with tons and tons of divisions. On the other hand, you have some much sort of smaller companies that actually just manufacture you know, one or two products, but they have this insanely high market share for that product. Um, what type of company are you typically more attracted to? You know, um, we, I guess <laughs> the... That's the B side. The P and the P will be extra important on those. You know, like if it's a, we, one of our good quotes, I don't know who came up with that, is like these kind of conglomerate structures, like some of the, like the, the big companies that you mentioned in Japan, if they've got great people at the top, it'll magnify the, the power of this conglomerate. If they got bad people, it'll make it way worse. And you won't know what's going on and they'll make the wrong moves at the wrong time and just want no part of that. You know, on the, uh, the kind of smaller, more focused high market share companies in Japan, some of those, it's, it, it can be hard to see how they grow. And that gets to how, you know, we, we want to be able to have a clear path to see free cash flow per share going higher in the years to come. So ideally, we would like a company that we can understand with good partners uh, that's going to grow. It's hard to find a lot of that on either of those extremes <laughs> in Japan or, or in many places, you know. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember you on a previous interview discussed your investment case uh, that you had for Sonic. And you said there are some things in that counting that seem sort of confusing. Can you expand upon those? What was sort of confusing in that counting? In the accounting of Sonic. So we found a good kind of uh, playbook can often be when companies have multiple businesses uh, within them, but they're transitioning more to the better, higher margin, higher return on capital, higher growth part. You know, Sonic had been a, a fast food restaurant company headquartered in Oklahoma, uh, small cap. You know, it had a good, good niche in what it did. Uh, but they had been a business model where they owned a lot of the restaurants previously, and they were going towards more of a pure franchised model. That leads to confusing accounting, like where are the earnings coming from? Is it the own stores or at the fee stores? And we kind of saw, you know, where this was going in terms of more earnings from the fee stores. Also saw, you know, probably as they transitioned to more of like a, a digitally driven business with a, with a good app, that would probably also improve their free cash flow um, characteristics. Um, and, you know, we wondered long term if this would be a public company, uh, if somebody, you know, strategic or financial would acquire it. Ultimately, it was bought by a private equity company um, at, a, at a good price. Um, but originally, you know, when we were buying it, it was like, when are their same store sales going to turn around? You know, what, what month, what quarter is that going to happen? And these numbers are confusing. So when I capitalize reported EPS, it looks like a high EPS multiple. We were just focused on, boy, free cash flow per share at this company can be higher in the years to come. We can understand this business. We've got a good partner in CEO, Cliff Hudson, who did the right thing. And uh, that was a good one.
Yeah, absolutely. And can you also discuss your analysis of Liberty Media when you owned it in the past? Well, you know, I was I was very lucky that Liberty was one of the first companies I got to work on at Southeastern. Uh, I think somebody said, hey, can you can you help me with the spreadsheet on this thing? And, <laughs> you know, I was I was very new and it was a very hard spreadsheet. I think they were testing me or torturing me or something. Uh, but, but it was also wonderful to get to go to these meetings and sit and listen to John Malone and then Greg Maffei just talk about business, talk about capital allocation and how they grow and realize value per share. I mean, these are some of the best teachers you could could ever hope for in this in this world um and uh so yeah we invested in it over 15 years ago now when it was just one liberty media imagine that um <laughs> and uh then we we saw that at that time they were probably going to break it up did we think that you know did we predict the next 15 plus years exactly no should we have held on to every share that we ever owned? Yes. So, so we did some too early selling, uh, but we've gone back into various parts. We had a good investment in, in Formula One. Um, we currently have an investment in Liberty Braves. We also recently went into Liberty Broadband. Um, so we just think these are top-notch people who are thinking every moment about growing and realizing value per share. And it's never going to be clear and simple with like guidance and here's the EPS and we welcome that you know because we know that they're they're looking out for shareholders over the long run and we've been lucky to partner with them. Yeah absolutely and we just discussed some of your um, past investments that became a success. What are some past investment thesis that didn't turn out uh, how you're expecting and didn't work out well? You know plenty of those there's the two out of five um, <laughs> we want to, uh, we want those to be ones where, you know, we were wrong, but we didn't lose much, you know, and we've certainly had plenty of those. We want to find them as soon as we can and, and not hold them for five years. You know, I think we've made some, some good strides on that, you know, qualities, um, within things where, you know, they didn't work. I'd say. I mean, I might answer this kind of broadly with the with the study we did. Um, you know, we looked at companies where they were, we kind of either classified them very simply as, is this a business or is this an asset? Um, and the businesses dramatically outperformed the assets. And it was even starker when the business had a strong balance sheet. So, you know, I look at a company where I was an analyst on like a, a Quicksilver Resources, which was like a small cap oil and gas company, um, seemed like it had good people and differentiated assets, but it was just an asset. And some of the, you know, liabilities ultimately got them. And we lost some money on that one. Whereas, you know, a company like, um, you know, Bail Resorts or Abbott Labs or something, those were more, these are ongoing businesses, great partners, strong balance sheets, value created. Um, so, we have learned to focus in on those businesses. If it is an asset or turns into an asset, then get it back onto the track of being a business and better make sure you got great people and a great balance sheet. Um, so, you know, we, we wish we could find every single place. What's the Charlie Munger quote? Just telling me I'm going to die so I don't go there. <laughs> but there's, you know, in in investing it's it's hard to totally avoid the losers so. and can you discuss a specific example of a past investment case that you had that was ended up being uh you know a mistake essentially one that we sold in the last year or two um would be uh you know viasat uh it was an interesting satellite company that we thought had some you know, unique kind of multiple segments. So it could be misunderstood. It had a steady government business. It had a, a large and growing, um, you know, satellite broadband business. And it looked like it had uh, good owners and good partners. Ultimately what happened, um, you know, some of this, their fault, some of it not, you know, sometimes you just have bad unexpected things. Like if you'd told me that money would be so free and that, you know, um, SpaceX would become so um, highly valued that they could launch 
thousands of satellites into the air and become a new competitor, boy, well, that was, that was something it just, it just happened, you know, and it, it changed the business case. And then the people side of things, you know, they made some moves that we agreed with some that we didn't. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, that was one of those where I think we ended up kind of break even on it, but break even over, you know, five plus years in a uh, rising market, not acceptable. So. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's switch talking a little about your research process. Uh, as part of your research process, do you find either, either quantitative or keyword screeners to be useful? And if so, how do you use them? Yes, we, we find screening to be useful. Um, you know, so much of, of screening um, really just involves going down the list. Like if I had to just say like, what is screening actually? It's just like sorting the list in new ways and just going down it every single day <laughs> and making sure that the team does that and that the team likes that, you know, that you get a team of curious people who are, you know, tenacious and are just going to keep working on it, you know? Um, so do we think we will ever write the perfect algorithm for the perfect screen? No, <laughs> not going to happen. Um, be that quantitative or qualitative, but can we use computers to help us, you know, be more efficient and sort those lists and, you know, be they the kind of keyword where it's like, oh, here's a management change and this person's saying some new things. That's great, you know. Um, or, you know, well, here's all the stocks that are, you know, on the new low list. That's a pretty basic one. Um, some of the most uh, basic uh, screens can, if anything, make us kind of nervous in the other direction. It's like, hmm, well, this company obviously has a low PE multiple. So what are we actually missing here? <laughs> you know, like we'd rather do something like when we invested in, in DreamWorks and it had a sky high PE multiple because they've had some dud movies for a while, but we knew their library was incredibly valuable and they had great partners uh, who would do the right thing ultimately at that company. Um, but the partners were out of favor uh, too, you know, because the opinion of people at companies usually tracks what the stock price <laughs> is doing. Um, so, uh, you know, all to say, yes, we use it, but, you know, we would hope that there are plenty of other things that go into the process as well. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And talking more about another sort of key val uh, value investing concept, which is the circle of competence. Do you feel like there's any industries that are outside of the firm circle of competence where you don't invest in as a firm? You know, um, we would hope not is the simple answer. Um, but the longer, more nuanced answer is that there are certainly industries that are better than others. <laughs> you know, they have a better structure. They have better demand tailwinds. Um, they, you know, require less capital than other industries. Um, you know, and some things that seem simple on the surface uh, can actually be quite hard to understand underneath. Um, you know, some places where we haven't done a ton, for example, where other value investors might and to their success would be things like banks sometimes, you know, uh, the bigger a bank gets, the harder it can be to understand, even if it prints an EPS number and prints a tangible book value per share number, there can be a lot going on behind that. And it can be capital intense and a very low return on assets. Doesn't mean we're not going to do it, but, you know, bars a little higher, especially without great partners, uh, which is sometimes the case at those kind of companies. Um, you know, countries, countries might be a little bit more of a rule out than industries, for us sometimes, you know, if it's a place that doesn't have a good rule of law and we can't really get our arms around what's going on there uh, and, and how it's gonna look in several years. And especially if there are not great partners available in that country, it's just like, well, here's, you know, so-and-so utility, here's so-and-so big bank, here's so-and-so, uh, you know, telecom. That's tough for us to, you know, be there on some of those state-owned enterprise type type things. And then um, switching to another topic, um, how important do you think an MBA or a CFA is in the investment management industry, especially in regards to value investing? Yeah, you know, we, we want um, people who are just curious self-starters themselves, and we are going to be focused less on 
their specific pre-existing qualifications and, and that kind of, you know, letters after the name type thing. Now, when people join us, um, especially if they're joining us on the younger side of things, we, we would like them usually to do this, the, the CFA program um, because we think it, it teaches a lot of the basics uh, and, and that's an efficient way to learn a lot of the basics. Um, an MBA uh, can be helpful, certainly, if you didn't um, learn a lot of the nuts and bolts uh, in, in college. But, you know, not everybody here is an MBA. And, uh, you know, I know I'm not, uh, for whatever that's worth. Um, but, uh, you know, business school can also be a great place to, you know, make a lot of good, important connections, which, you know, is important for, for our network. Um, so, Really, it's kind of a personal preference thing. It's not a rule in, rule out for us on either of those. We just want to know that the the candidate, as we like to say, gets it. You know, <laughs> understands value per share and 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 paying less and getting more. Yeah, absolutely. And then switching back to some of your, um, you know, discussing some of the investment pieces. Uh, can you discuss your investment pieces on Mattel? Mattel. Yep. So. Uh, this one, business people price. Um, we've been in it in it for a few years, and it's it's been uh, been a strong one recently. So on the business side of things, um, we saw, you know, great brands and IP with with pricing power. Um, you know, uh, not many kids go into the store and say, "Mom, buy me the third cheapest doll," <laughs> or you know, I just. Uh, uh, I don't really want Hot Wheels. I just kind of want some cars. Like that's that doesn't really have, like these are real brands. Um, and what we saw coming down the pipe, uh, just getting to the people side of things, which had some challenges for us initially in this investment. Um, it was a very undermanaged set of assets. You know, they had gotten basically almost down to break even on on cash flow, which was just crazy. For brands like this. Um, and then we looked at what Hasbro could do and was doing on, on margins. And we knew this could be a teens plus uh, pre-tax margin business uh, just because of the strength of what was there. Um, and ultimately the CEO, Inan Kreis, got us there. Uh, and he deserves wonderful credit for that. But it also helps when you go into a situation like that to just kind of have some pretty clear and obvious ways that this can work out. For example, at Hasbro, uh, roughly similar revenue level, I believe there were 6,000 employees. Uh, Mattel, there was almost 30,000. That's a pretty big difference. <laughs> and, uh, and we knew that Mattel could have, you know, better streamlined company. What still is to, to come, even though Mattel has, has now gotten margins much closer to where they, they should be, there's still some growth left there. Uh, the top line is growing nicely. They have still yet to tap their intellectual property uh, by making a good Barbie movie, uh, by making, you know, good Masters of the Universe content, which is, is kind of happening more now on Netflix. Hot Wheels, still nowhere near where it should be. That's the kind of stuff that's hard to put into a spreadsheet, but we still really like it. And uh, we think that Enon has a lot of good, good credibility uh, already built up. We like how he's coming at this IP thing. It got delayed a year or so by, by COVID. But again, Hasbro had been years ahead of us. We think we can, can catch him. And uh, there's a lot of upside to come. And it's also the kind of valuable content that we think other parties would, would like to, to own, would like to partner with. So we'll see where that goes. Yeah, absolutely. And we spoke a little bit uh, earlier about DCFs. And just talking about maybe one, do you tend to choose exit multiples or terminal growth for DCFs? And do you have a reasoning for doing for why one over the other? And secondly, how do you come up with the discount rates for DCFs? Yeah, so we we don't ever want to be like on the vanguard of either of these things, right? Uh, you know, we want to keep it simple. Um, uh, we don't want to be overly conservative, but we sure don't want to be overly aggressive either. Um, so our standard DCF just kind of can talk about how it works. Um, you know, we're going to model out the first eight or so years. Um, here's how it can 
grow on the top line, how that gets to the bottom line. Um, it's an unlevered DCF. So, um, you know, cash and debt are adjusted for separately and as are other non-earning assets. Um, but, you know, our, our discount rate will vary by country. You know, it's in the mid to high single digits, you know, seven, eight percent in, in most developed markets today. Fifteen years ago, that would have been closer to 10 percent. Right. Um, uh, then you get to the terminal multiple where we we do use a multiple instead of an R minus G type calculation. With the R minus G, you can get some really big numbers, especially with the low discount rate and you kind of look up and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, I'm valuing the terminal multiple at more than I'm paying going in. That that doesn't make sense. You know, like true conservative investing, you've got to have an effective exit at or below what you're paying going in. Now that could be on revenues or, or some other kind of thing. You know, like it would have been silly on Mattel to limit that to like the near infinity <laughs> PE that we were paying initially. You know, like that's that could that could be, you know, kind of silly. Um, so what we like, how we like to think about it, and it's a little bit kind of art versus science on this, this terminal multiple is that, you know, over the long run in most developed markets, the, the market multiple on average has been kind of 14, 15, 16 ish, depending, you know, maybe up to 17 ish, depending on the time frame you want to look at. So if you said to yourself, okay, I can have either this one company. <laughs> or the entire market, which would you probably rather have? I mean, you got to have some really high confidence in that one company versus the whole market. That's why we don't want to go much above that 16, 17 times. And it'll cause us to miss some stuff sometimes. And, and you know, that's just part of life as a conservative value investor. But we think um, that anchors us a lot more um, than than an R minus G. And, and again, 16 is not the default. Like if this company, we have a hard time seeing how it's going to grow and we're paying a single digit multiple going in, the terminal multiple might be more like 10, 11, 12 or something. Um, if it's, if your terminal multiple is going to be lower than that, it might not be worth investing in this thing. <laughs> uh, but you know, each, each one can be different. Yeah, absolutely. And um, can you just talk to us a little bit, how did you get uh, interested in investing initially and specifically why did value investing appeal to you? You know, um, I think there is a part of it where you're sort of born with it or not. And I guess that's not a very interesting answer <laughs> to the whole getting it thing. Um, but, you know, when I was growing up, I was always interested in little like, you know, money making ventures or something. And collecting things like baseball cards and, you know, memorizing all the prices that the price guides had for the baseball and basketball cards. Um, and then I, you know, had a little, tried a little business where I sold used video games at school or something, you know, it was just that kind of dollar for, for 50 cents type thing. Um, and then, you know, I was uh, just reading more and more about investing, um, you know, uh, and, and as I uh, got, you know, like a little money from my, my grandmother to invest or something like that, I, I looked into, okay, how, what's the best way to do this to, to truly, you know, do it in a way that makes sense. Um, and it was a very rudimentary version of business people price after, you know, reading uh, the writings of, of Warren Buffett, of Ben Graham. Um, you know, I grew up in in, in Memphis and uh, Little Rock. So I got to, to know about Southeastern as well. That was, that was a good, good stroke of luck there. Um, and, and then, you know, one, um, one, when I really started doing it myself was kind of a, a pretty key important moment in my life, actually. Um, and I've, I think I've told this story on another thing before, but I won't, I won't do the whole long thing, but, uh, it was the the winter of of 2000 kind of the height of the dot com crash and um you know uh i was a freshman in college <laughs> uh and we had had some some of our our family's money in in the longleaf family of funds southeastern's family of funds um and that was all sold and turned into tech stocks and then it was kind of like hey ross you you figure this thing out and you do with it what you want. 
So that was a pretty good crash course. Like I need to figure out how to value these things. And I was doing very rudimentary math. And I was like, wow, these are some pretty high prices. <laughs> things like JDS Uniphase and Cisco and AOL Time Warner. And uh, ultimately I sold them uh, very soon <laughs> and uh, went into, you know, cash and some value stocks and kind of back into to Longleaf uh, as well. And I think because I was able to uh, tell that story with credibility to, to Southeastern, uh, they ultimately took a chance um, on me. They didn't, they didn't hire me right, at, right when I graduated because I didn't know anything that was a smart move on their part. But I think they knew that I wasn't somebody who was riding high in the dot-com thing. And, and then I realized value investing was good. I think it was kind of through, through my own research I got there. Uh, first, fortunately. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that story with us. And uh, can you talk about your uh, thesis for Lumen Technologies as well, please? Lumen. So, Lumen on business people price. Uh, the business side of things, uh, kind of like some of my other earlier stories, there are multiple uh, businesses here. So, it's not just one where it's easy to slap a multiple on the whole thing. Um, on the stronger side of things, they have. Uh, you know, fiber telecom assets, extremely high replacement cost value. It's hard to dig up these streets and lay the fiber. Um, and, you know, a lot of these fiber connections are to buildings and that enterprise fiber business should, should grow faster than the wholesale fiber business, which is a more competitive business. Um, then uh, after they merged with um, CenturyLink uh, a few years ago, we came in through the level three side of things. Um, once they merged with CenturyLink, they picked up this, uh, this business that's more of a kind of legacy copper landline type business. Less growth, um, potential to upgrade some of those assets into valuable kind of fiber assets. And that gets to the people and some of our engagement we've been up to here. We have a, a 13D, so there's a few things I, I am not, I guess, able to go into and It'll be interesting to see how certain of these things, you know, play out as people are listening to this, uh, this YouTube. Um, but what we did uh, when we filed our, our 13D in late 2020 was we said, you know, we think the company needs to really explore its options further and maybe monetize some of these assets. Uh, and they did. Uh, they announced two very important deals last year. Um, one where they're selling, uh, still in the process, not closed yet, their Latin American uh, telecom assets that are more along the fiber enterprise line of things uh, for nine times EBITDA, which we think is a solid price. Um, and, you know, some higher discount rate companies in the mix there, like Argentina. Um, then they're also selling um, certain of the copper landline states in which they do business for five and a half times EBITDA. Um, again, not as much growth there as other parts of their business, but good, good, solid assets that the private equity can do different things with. So, so take note that those two businesses that might be on the lower multiple end of the two different parts of their business sold at those prices at a time when the whole company was trading at five to five and a half times EBITDA. <laughs> and, you know, they announced it and the market yawned and if anything went down. And so the company that same quarter uh, announced a buyback. They bought back 7% of their shares, probably the best acquisition they could do. Uh, now here we are today. Uh, you know, they just reported a quarter that I would say was, was viewed disappointingly by the market and I can understand why that happened. Uh, but we think that could ultimately, you know, be masking some other opportunities at this company that they've talked about, you know, further asset rationalization, future share buybacks, and these are just very strategic assets in a world where the demand for bits goes up uh, every year and transporting those through fiber that's already been laid is, you know, still a pretty good business. It should, over the long run, be more like a, an infrastructure <laughs> asset class, more like a railroad or a toll road uh, than, and, and, you know, you can see what what private players will pay for those types of assets on a double digit EBITDA multiple than the, you know, very low single digit multiple of free cash flow, which it trades, but um, we're going to help the company get there. We'll see.
Yeah, excellent. And uh, what are some long-term impacts that you think um, happened because of COVID? Boy, that could be its own YouTube. Um, <laughs> I think uh, what what we're trying to do now are are kind of um, you know because in in 2020 and 2021, lots of parts of those you know the the clear COVID winners were were flying pretty high, you know, and the clear COVID losers were in the other direction. Um, over the last several months, the stock market has been going somewhat in the other direction. You know, even after it kind of took Omicron in stride. Um, and we, um, so, so we're, we're wary of things where demand was pulled forward in a one-time situation and the business itself might not actually be that great. You know, people just actually happen to get stimulus checks and go spend a bunch of money on this company's product or something like that, you know, or people were trapped inside and just had to do this thing for a bit. Um, we definitely think that a more flexible, you know, working environment is here to stay, you know, at our company and others. And we, we, we welcome that. I think it's good. I mean, I'm coming to you from an office, but, you know, we don't have to be in the office every day. Um, and so what does that mean for, for different types of, of real estate values remains to be seen. A lot depends on the people and the price <laughs> when you're looking at some of those real estate assets. Um, you know, certain things like, I mean, I remember when I did some of my first Zooms pre-COVID, I was like, what is this? Um, <laughs> and then now it's just so second nature. I mean, it's, there will be some amount of reduced business travel, no doubt. I mean, I just, um, you know, one of our investees, uh, Hyatt, uh, hotels, you know, we had a, a podcast with them and, and we're, we're talking about that. Um, you know, in the early days of COVID, it was just extremely scary. Nobody's going anywhere for anything. Well, now there's more leisure travel than, than anybody ever would have thought. So there's been a lot more balancing out um, because people do ultimately want to move around. They do like being together. Um, you know, it also seems like one kind of broader macro thing worth mentioning is that even though in the earlier days of COVID, it led to low interest rates and a flood of stimulus, that seems like it could be going the other direction pretty hard. And if you look at demographic trends that were building, uh, you know, in the years before COVID, actually a lot of them started kind of tipping over right around COVID into a world where money might be more scarce that might lead to higher interest rates that probably favors investors who focus on actual free cash flow and free cash flow power like most value investors and less on like a, an R minus G <laughs> terminal thing, you know, 20 years from now. I've seen, I've seen so many DCFs like that over the last few years and those DCFs were winning <laughs> versus our DCFs. And that's, that was painful <laughs> because that was the kind of DCFing that was going on in 1974 when Mason uh, founded our company, it's the kind of DCFing that was going on, you know, 20 years ago in the dot-com boom when, you know, Mason and Staley were sticking to their guns and I was a teensy little client.